Good afternoon. Welcome to today's PASS webinar, Speed Analysis and Calculations for Attorneys. This one-hour program will demonstrate by case examples and videos the most typical methods of speed calculation in automotive collisions. This program will also cover commonly used calculations dealing with skid and yard marks, crush analysis, and event data recorder downloads. The presenter for today's webinar is Frank Costanzo. Frank is a traffic accident reconstruction specialist with over 1,500 full-scale collision investigation and component defect evaluation. Frank is a certified court expert with over 24 years of experience in collision reconstruction, defect investigation, biomechanical analysis, and injury causation studies. If you have a question that pertains to the presentation, we do ask that you use the chat feature or Q&A feature, which are found on the right-hand side of the screen, to submit your question to the presenter. Frank will do his best to answer your questions during the presentation. Tomorrow morning, I will send out an email with a link to the archive recording of the webinar. And we do ask that you take time to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen after the webinar is over. I now invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'm going to turn it over to our distinguished presenter, Frank Costanzo. Frank, the presentation is now all yours. Okay, um, thanks for everybody attending the webinar, uh, the CLE presentation. Um, when I was asked to do this uh, CLE uh, webinar, I've uh, done many in the past, many different subjects, and I uh, was asked to do something that was of interest uh, across the board. And I have to tell you, when, I, when someone calls me and I get a case in, um, speed seems to be the issue in almost every case. So I wanted to give you this uh, CLE presentation uh, to show what we, what I as an expert or you as an attorney can expect in your cases uh, when we deal with speed issues. Uh, like Matt was saying, if you have any questions, if it's not too specific, please forward it. We'll take a little break halfway through and answer any kind of questions uh, someone would have uh, during the, uh, looking at the presentation. Uh, we, we always use this term, and I say we, I guess I should classify all accident experts, I'll just refer to us as we. Uh, there's a term, you know, reasonable degree of engineering certainty. Uh, to me, what that means is there's a certain, uh, certain percentage, a, a reasonable degree of certainty when it comes to our, uh, conclusions. And, to reach that reasonable degree of certainty is basically the, the accuracy in which the data is provided to us in the investigation. Now, when a, when a person, when an action reconstruction starts at the beginning, does the field investigation, progresses through, there should be a, even a high degree of certainty. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case, as most of you know. Uh, we're presented with information, whether it's from the police report, photographs, and uh, it has to reach that degree of certainty uh, for us to be able to present it in reports and be able to testify. Uh, the typical uses of an accident reconstruction, if you've never used one, uh, we do speed reconstructions, skid mark analysis, and I'll explain all these, uh, yaw mark analysis, there's a technique called momentum which gives us impact speeds. Uh, we do crush analysis, crush analysis is used a lot in uh, component defect investigations. We determine vault analysis, which you'll see in pedestrian motorcycles, which I'll explain. Uh, one of the big air fields right now are tractor trailer downloads and airbag downloads of vehicles to be able to get uh, very viable information in regards to the accident. Let's start off about as simple as we can start. Um, this, this photograph you're looking at is a skid mark from a motorcycle. It's a single skid mark. And uh, one thing I want to point out with a skid mark, this is a very fresh skid mark I did the investigation. Uh, down at the bottom where you see that little marking, looks like it's annotating the beginning of the skid mark. Uh, that section that seems lighter than the rest of the section, that section's called the impending skid. And what the impending skid is, is when the tire starts to lock up, uh, is locked up, but it isn't tracking as hard as the, the rest of the, the uh, mark. 
Uh, interestingly, when an expert was one at, once asked in court uh, to explain to the jury what a skid mark was, and to my surprise, he said, well, it's the tire, it's the rubber from the tire. Uh, actually, some of it is the rubber from the tire, but the majority of the mark is actually on asphalt. The majority of the mark is burnt asphalt. As the tire is skidding, it's heating up the surface, and it's tracking the same way the tire would, and actually burning a little bit of the surface, making it darker. As you can see, as the tire gets hotter, it leaves a, a longer progressed uh, skid mark. When we do speed calculations for skid marks on the right-hand side, we need to really know two things, and that's really all we need to know. We need to know the length of the skid mark, and we need to know the coefficient of friction. Uh, the coefficient of friction is the ability of the road to pull on the tire. So as you're sliding, if you can, pick, you can picture like a hand on the road, that hand is gripping your tire. It's the, the frictional value between the tire and the road surface. Ideally, that should be tested at the time that the accident is. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't happen uh, in some cases. Uh, you'll see people using uh, general values uh, for wet and asphalt services, dry services. But ideally, some testing should be done on the roadway surface. Uh, what does a skid mark look like? Well, there's a couple things. A skid mark has straight appearance and striations. Uh, we need to know the length. And when we talk about uh, it will provide us a minimal travel speed, and I can explain it this way. Uh, if this motorcycle hit a pedestrian, and the pedestrian uh, basically uh, doesn't weigh a lot, say a, a child, um, that motorcycle is going to skid from its initial travel speed to its, where its final rest is. So that skid mark that we're looking at here in that scenario I just gave you would actually be the overall travel speed of the motorcycle because the pedestrian weighing, you know, say 20 pounds is not going to have effect on the speed of the motorcycle. Now, when we deal with situations where we have uh, vehicles, and I'll give you the best scenario I usually use is, uh, a car is coming up the roadway, locks up their brakes, leaves a set of skid marks on the road, slides off the road and hits a tree. Well, when you're looking at that skid mark and you're calculating the speed of that skid mark in that event, it's only going to provide you a minimal speed because you're losing all the speed. You know, you don't know what this will be calculated, but you don't know what the speed is of the tree. So in most cases, it's going to provide us minimal travel speeds. Um, and that's about it. This is a little speed nomograph. You see them in some books, and um, and it looks great on this presentation. I'll give Tassa a, a credit for the clarity. Uh, it's a neat little tool. It's not very much. Uh, if you want it, uh, I certainly can direct you. But on the left hand side, you can see it says skid distance. On the on the right hand side, you see it says coefficient of friction. Uh, so in general, uh, you know, a dry roadway would be like a .75. And the reason why this is interesting is if you go into a deposition and you're fielding questions, someone's giving you some information, and uh, uh, attorneys tell me, tell me over and over again, look, I just don't like to ask a question that I don't already know the answer to. That seems to be the common uh, knowledge in cross-examinations and depositions. Well, if someone tells you that there's a skid mark, say a uh, hundred so feet, and it's a dry roadway surface, all you need to do is draw a line, and the intersecting value is the speed per hour. Uh, so it looks like in this, uh, the speed per hour would be about 50 miles an hour. So if you're taking a deposition of a police officer, and he's saying the skid distance was a hundred feet, and he's saying it's a dry roadway surface, and then he goes on to say, my calculated speed was 30 miles an hour, uh, you can see how that doesn't coincide, and, and additional questions would have to be asked of that um, that police officer. I like to keep this tool. It's a real quick way of uh, doing a speed calculation. Uh, this chart is a chart most experts see and use. Uh, when I was telling you, you know, for instance, we don't. Sometimes we don't get hired right away. We'll get hired two years after the accident. And in some cases, even the accident, the roadway's been resurfaced. 
So if the roadway's been resurfaced and we weren't able to test the coefficient of friction, you'll see experts use common values for coefficient of friction. This is the chart that they use. Uh, you can print it out, have it on file, but this is the chart the experts use to be able to get a guideline for coefficient of frictions. Uh, skid marks. Skid marks are made a couple, let's go back to skid marks for one second. The reason why a skid mark is produced is the tire is locked and sliding. So when you're skidding, your tire is locked and you're sliding. A, a skid mark cannot be curved because once your axle is locked, it's going to go in the straight direction in which your, your axle was initially locked. So most skid marks, uh, almost all skid marks are straight in appearance. So your tire's locked and you're sliding. You have no control over the vehicle, no steering control, because your axle's locked. So an individual may say in a deposition that I locked up my brakes and I was steering left or right. That would not be the case. You can't do that unless you have any locked brakes, which we'll talk about in a little. Another mark uh, is a, a term called a yaw mark. A yaw mark is a tire that's spinning and sliding sideways. Now, what, what can I give you as an example, an example of a yaw mark? Uh, I use yaw marks explanations in my area. Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of deer in my area, and what people do, they don't tend to lock up their brakes. They tend to steer away from the deer. Well, when the person steers off the roadway to avoid a deer, their tire is spinning and sliding sideways. It will use, uh, use, uh, produce a mark called a yaw mark. Now, I told you in a skid mark, you need to know the length and the coefficient of friction. The yaw mark is a little different. We need to know the curvature of the yaw mark and the coefficient of friction. So if someone tells me that a yaw mark is 150 feet in length, it, it does not mean anything to me because I need to be able to know the curvature of the yaw mark. Uh, so uh, we could go into a little more detail how to measure the cur curvature or the radius of the yaw mark, but that is what... We, is needed. So if you're taking a deposition of an expert or a police officer and he uses the term uh, what was available to him, he saw some yaw marks to the scene, it's not that it, it's a, it's important to know the length, but really the question needs to be asked him, did you measure the radius of that yaw mark? And what that provides us is an initial travel speed of the person who's producing that yaw mark. Um, because there's no really active braking going on in that situation. Uh, to the left, you'll see how the striations, they look up, uh, they look better at the bottom of the photograph. You can see how the striations kind of go sidewards. Uh, that's because the, the, the tire is sliding sidewards. And it looks much different if you compare this to the skid uh, striations, you can see the difference. Uh, yaw marks are usually curved in appearance, they're not straight. This is a situation uh, in my area where an individual was steering uh, lost control on a two-lane roadway. You can see how the yaw marks left her travel lane and proceeded across the right travel lane and into the shoulder. Uh, when we get the radius of this curvature, I can tell you how fast she was traveling in the left-hand travel lane. It's not a minimal speed. It's what we call an actual speed. talked about that one. In the same idea, um, the same idea is used, this is a motorcycle case, but the same idea is used for the term called critical speed. Um, the reason why we talk about critical speeds are uh, every inherent curve that you go around uh, has a critical speed. And what the critical speed is, it's saying that there is a speed in which a car, a maximal speed in which a car can take this curve without losing control and going off the right-hand side of the roadway. Uh, it's based on two things. If you look at this picture, it's based on the radius of the curvature. It's based on the coefficient of friction, so it's based on the pull of the road on the tires. And it's also based on the cross slope, which was, be, would be the elevation. So when you get a curve and uh, someone loses control going around the curve, and you know what the critical speed is, you will get an idea of how fast a person is proceeding towards a curve. Uh, usually, a critical speed in design uh, categories, it's probably twice the speed limit. Uh, if it's not twice the speed limit, then you'll start to see uh, curve warning signs asking you to reduce your speed coming up to the curve. 
if the curve has a, for instance, if the curve has a curve warning sign at 25 miles an hour, you can pretty safely, most curves take it about 50 without having uh, really issues. Uh, this was an impact where motorcyclists uh, was estimated going about 95 by a witness, came up to this curve way too fast for the critical speed of this curve. Uh, the individual starts to leave a rear skid mark, which is in the right photograph, and skids into the guide rail because he, in an attempt to try to avoid the curve and the guard, guide rail, and unfortunately splits the, not, over, not only the motorcycle in half, but splits himself in half. And the motorcycle goes, after the impact, goes an additional 400 feet uh, on, in the, under the underpass. Uh, this is the damage in the motorcycle. It's about the motorcycle in half, but the person was not in great shape. Okay, uh, let's just keep moving along. Uh, there's the um, an idea of crust deformation. And a lot of these presentations, which were kind of glossing over our whole CLEs that take an hour. So I'm going to give you uh, kind of the quick thumbnail of what these uh, functions do and, and how we could proceed with them. A crush deformation, uh, you can see those little sticks. Those little sticks are measuring the crush of the car. Uh, so let's just take the blue car down on the right-hand side and kind of these two cars collided causing a fatality. But uh, I just kind of want you to use your imagination for a minute and uh, look at the blue car. And let's assume that blue car hit a wall. And we're taking the crush measurements of the car. There's computer programs that um, once we know the crush of the car and we know the specifications of the car in regards to the weight of the car, the stiffness of the car, the size of the car, there's computer programs that we can enter this data into and get variables as far as impact speeds. Uh, impact speeds uh, are important for crash worthiness cases. If you're going to argue that a seatbelt failed or an airbag did not deploy properly or some kind of component in the car failed, uh, you're going to be, you need to be able to calculate uh, an impact speed or a barrier equivalent speed to be able to say uh, that it was below the threshold. I, I get many cases where I go, for instance, to look at a seatbelt that failed, and you look at it and say, yes, indeed, this thing failed, but the barrier equivalent velocity is 55 miles an hour you hit the wall. Well, the government regulations, uh, you know, go up to barrier equivalent speeds 25 miles an hour. The argument is, which is a correct argument, saying they will fail, they're not tanks, and there's a threshold which they will fail because uh, we can't make these cars uh, as stiff as we really want them because then they would weigh too much. Uh, one thing about the crush analysis, uh, as you can see, the car, if you hire someone to do this, the car has to be in its damaged state. It cannot be partially taken apart. Uh, if it's if people take accurate photographs, you may be able to get some accurate crush measurements from it, but ideally uh, the, the uh, accident reconstructionist wants to be able to personally inspect the car. Um, that becomes an issue. Criminal cases, sometimes they want to inspect the car and they tell uh, the people involved, uh, you know, we can't let you see it until the criminal part's over. And then you wait and you wait and you call the police a year later and they say, oh, well, we should have kept up. We released it and it was crushed. These are uh, two black limos. Uh, the first on the right hand side is the frontal impact of a black limo and the bottom left is a rear impact of the black limo. So there's crush involved in both cases. Uh, in these cases if they're you know, struck you can be able to calculate impact speeds, the speed would be necessary to cause this type of damage on these vehicles. Uh, like I said, the, ideally the vehicles uh, should be available for inspection. Uh, I put this one on these little smart cars. You know, unfortunately, uh, no, she wasn't in the car, so don't worry, but then on the right-hand side, sometimes you get crush profiles that, you know, the whole car's damaged you're not going to be able to get an accurate crush profile for it, so the speed reconstructions uh, would not be accurate. Uh, I would not think it would be very accurate. In the right-hand uh, example, 
of that little smart car hit by a tractor pulling a uh, flatbed. So uh, to kind of reiterate, you need to inspect the, the subject vehicles. You need to establish a crush profile. Uh, you need to know manufacturer specifications. It's not too difficult unless it's a very strange type of vehicle. And we'll provide you data regarding impact severity speed. This is a this is a good example of how uh, whoops this would be a good example of how uh, what a crush analysis would be used for. You're going to see a vehicle come into view on your right hand side coming down, and it crashes going through a toll booth. Uh, the, it was an older vehicle. I did this case, and it was an older uh, vehicle. Um, if the crush profile is presented to us, and we take the crush measurements of that car, unfortunately, it's severely damaged, damaged with fire. Uh, we would use a crush analysis to be able to determine the impact speed of that car into that immovable uh, barrier. We're going to keep going. Uh, there's a section halfway through. We can take a break. Uh, you can post some questions uh, and kind of let's keep moving on to, the, I call this the speed reconstruction kind of section of the CLE. Uh, sometimes you'll hear a term momentum analysis. And what a momentum analysis does is if we know these following uh, variables for a two-car collision, uh, we're able to do a momentum analysis, and basically what a momentum analysis is, it's the idea that if if we can calculate the speed going out of the collision for both cars, we can then calculate the speed going into the collisions based on Newton's laws of motion, that energy is never really lost in the collision, it's just transferred. For momentum uh, calculations, we need to know the point of impact between the two cars. We know the final, we need to know the final rest positions of both cars. We need to know the manufacturer specifications, which is not a problem. And we also need to be, need to be accurately be able to document the scene information. Um, the first two, the point of impact and final rest positions of the cars, are, I would call them the sticking points of this momentum analysis because unless you're a, a police officer investigating a case, uh, you may not have access to that type of information. If you're a plaintiff or defense attorney and you get something on, in the civil arena, uh, we may be able to get that type of information from a complete uh, police investigation. Uh, unfortunately, in our area, unless something's really a fatal, uh, they're not going to go to that extent to be able to document all that information. Uh, momentum analysis in general is not really used as much as... Uh, or the other two, other three analysis, speed analysis I was showing you. And then this would be the reason. I'll give you a, a good example of momentum analysis and the positive and negative aspects of the momentum analysis. This was an accident where the drunk driver is coming up to the stop sign um, on the right-hand side. I can tell you that the individual did not stop for the stop sign, and I'll explain how we know that, but the... the this individual is going to go through the stop sign. Uh, in the opposite direction, uh, there's two elderly ladies. Uh, they live at this house. You can see where the black mailbox is. You can see the stop sign in the foreground on the left photograph. Uh, they're going to make a left turn into the driveway. Um, this resulted in the fatality of both of the uh, individuals in the car that's turning. The reason why I use this is when you do a momentum analysis, you just want to be aware of a couple things. One is it provides speeds of both cars, not just one car, but both cars. So in this case, I know the individual did not stop at the stop sign because the impact speed was so high that he could not get from the stop position from the stop sign to the point of impact with the speed that was calculated. So I know he did not, and it was acknowledged by him, he did not stop at the stop sign. Now, I, I give this when I do a full CLE. I'll give you a, a quick uh, how a momentum analysis affects a case. I was doing this for the defense of the ladies who were turning into the driveway. 
If I told you, I'm going to tell you two different stories, and you can determine your own. What I wanted to tell the defense attorney was you have a very good case because, first of all, I know he didn't stop at the stop sign. Second of all, he's uh, impaired alcohol-wise. And I know he was speeding over the speed limit, and he didn't perceive or react to the event because there was no skid marks, and a collision occurred. What I had to do is complete the story and tell you that the girl, the ladies turning, making the left-hand turn, were going about 21 miles an hour as they were making this kind of turn into the driveway. And uh, the attorney looked at me and said, are you telling me that the uh, the ladies did not stop and yield the right away before they made the left turn. I said, no, they, they can't get the 21 miles an hour from a stop position. So it, it caused, uh, you know, the two stories caused different issues. So if you're going to hire someone to do a momentum analysis or you see a report to list the momentum analysis and only list the speed of one car, I can tell you that that's probably done on purpose because the speed of the other car is probably detrimental to the case. What's interesting when we do crush analysis and, and injury causations, these are the two cars that were involved in the collision I just showed you with the elderly people. What's of interest is when um, well, the car, the, the individual who went through the stop sign, his car uh, caught on fire. He was out of the car before it happened. But the ladies who were in the red car both died of fatal, uh, fatal injuries. If you walk past that car in a driveway or in a salvage yard, you would never know, you wouldn't think, that two people died in this case. Uh, so injury causation studies are done because we have to be able to correlate not only the impact speed but other uh kind of variables in regards to people who receive certain injuries. And I can tell you the, the overriding variable in this case was the two elderly sisters who were about 88 years old. And it is true. You are more susceptible to injuries as you get older. Okay, we're going to take a, a quick little break here for questions and answers. I'll uh, be glad to answer anything. I, I think they come up on my screen, on, uh, screen under the Q&A tab. Um, and feel free to ask uh, anyone you know, any questions you have at this point. Definitely. Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, we do have one question here, and I would urge all attendees to um, use the Q&A or chat feature, which are found at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the, the chat should be highlighted in orange because I've been sending out a couple messages. Uh, you can just... Um, just open up that screen and use it to submit your question. Uh, Frank, how long is the physical evidence visible on a roadway? Uh, that's a pretty good question. Uh, in, in general, the, the one photograph I showed you of that single tire uh, motorcycle mark, uh, on a residential roadway, it would probably be there for a good month. Uh, if it was on, say, Interstate I-95 in this area, uh, it would probably fade in a week, uh, depending on the rain and the weather conditions and the traffic patterns. So it really depends where the skid marks made, but optimistically I would say you would have to get out there in probably a week to be able to accurately see the whole skid mark. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question here from Steven who asks, um, he, uh, for whatever reason, has some, there were some technical difficulties and his connection went in and out um, during the discussion of the immovable uh, barrier uh, scenario. Uh, can you uh, briefly review that again for the attendees who may have missed a little of it? Uh, I guess he's talking about the immovable barrier in regards to the crush calculations. Um, I believe, yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, I was given that scenario that um, – a car strikes an immovable barrier, uh, and uh, the crush that's received, the crush that's on the car is going to be able to tell us how fast that car struck that immovable barrier. Because the immovable barrier is not going to absorb any en energy. It's just basically you know, like a wall. A wall doesn't, doesn't absorb energy, so all the energy and the uh, damage is seen on the striking vehicle. And the immovable objects are walls, uh, you know, heavy trucks, um, poles, usually poles do a lot of damage. It says here, 
when the roadway is wet, can you still get an accurate speed? Um, as far as skid marks, uh, people think just because it's wet it doesn't track. Uh, it will track. Uh, if a car, if it's wet enough where the uh, tires don't track, then we won't be able to do an accurate speed calculation when the methods we were just talking about, these four methods we were talking about. So the, the, the ability, well, ability, the surface condition has a lot to do with the skid analysis and the yaw analysis. It has a lot to do with the momentum analysis, but it would have very little to do with a crush analysis. Uh, hey, great. Uh, I have a question here from Greg who asks, um, how can I print out the or find the coefficient of friction chart and uh, possibly the other charts that you used uh, during the first half of the presentation, Frank? Um, there's a book called uh, Baker and Frick, B-A-R-K-E-R, Frick, F-R-I-C-K-E. I believe they're both in, it's called the Accident Reconstruction Manual, and it was produced in 1999, 1990, I'm sorry, 1990. Uh, they have both those charts. Uh, they're good reference books, too. You can order them. I think uh, Lawyer's Digest has them. Uh, but just do a search on the Internet, you'd be able to find them. I would buy the book. I think the book's $50. It has those um, those two charts I showed you in that book. Okay, great. We have a, a, another question here from Stephen who asks, uh, is there a quote-unquote general quote-unquote thumbnail analysis I can do myself based upon the photograph of the damage to a vehicle, basically hypothesizing from make, model, speed limit of roadway, and type of hit? Um, in, in general, you know, a general thumb there is when we're doing, uh, you can't do it from the skid and the, uh, the skid mark, you'd have to use that you know, on that one. Um, the skid mark speed is a formula. Uh, the speed equals a square mark of 30 DF. And DF, that was in that one slide. D is the distance of the skid mark. F is, in, is the coefficient of friction. That will give you, that formula there will give you an idea of the speed analysis, you know, how much speed is lost by that skid. As far as crush analysis, there's a kind of an understanding that for every inch and a half of crush equals one mile an hour. So, uh, you know, People even do a one-to-one -one ratio, which I think will give you kind of a high speed. So, for instance, if you had uh, one inch of crush and you're using a one one inch to one mile per hour and it hit an um, immovable barrier, that would basically be 40 miles an hour. Um, just, just so you know, I mean, uh, that's really a general thumbnail because cars differ like that. Uh, I showed you that... Uh, Limousine. That limousine is going to weigh probably like around 6,500 pounds, where uh, you know a Kia Sophia weighs about 2,500. So just be careful. It really depends on what type of car you're looking at um, to use a general thumbnail. Okay, great. I don't see any other questions in the queue. Uh, so Frank, why don't we continue on with the presentation of content? Um, for all the attendees, we will be taking. A, uh, a break after uh, this portion of the or after this presentation of content, uh, another Q question and answer break. So please keep your questions coming in, and we'll hold them till the end, and then we'll we'll take a break and answer all of them. Thank you for your great question. Uh, we're going to do um, some other subjects of interest. Uh, next thing is airbag deployments. Uh, cars now, I mean, you would be hard pressed to find a car that does not have some kind of airbag system. When an airbag system deploys on certain makes and models, uh, there is a, there is different terms for it, but, you know, you hear EDR, electronic data recorder, you hear uh, uh, people always refer to this slang. They say it's a black box. Actually, it's a little silver box. But there's also, when the airbag deploys, and even in non-deployment situations, this electronic box it uh, gives us information in regards to impact speed. Now, for the GM vehicles, uh, they give you five seconds prior to impact. So you'll be, in, and I'll show you a graph, you'll be able to kind of read the GM uh, graph very clearly, and we'll show you five seconds prior to impact what this car was doing before the airbags deployed. Um, 
nowadays technology, like anything else in society, technology is catching up with this action investigation field where we have become kind of uh, focused in on downloads now. Uh, downloads are a little bit, um, you know, kind of buyer beware type of thing. The court system in various states have said, uh, for instance, some states have said you just can't use the downloads to testify in regards to speeds. Most states have said the following, that you can use the download in support of any kind of calculation you're given, but you just can't go in there and have two cars collide in action, download the modules, go in and say, this car's going that fast, this car's going this fast. Uh, my experience is I've never had problems getting the data in the court, but it's my understanding that there's, there's been fights about it prior to, I, prior to me testifying. Uh, the next slide, uh, slide 25, is the download of the GM uh, deployment. You can see, uh, look at the graph below. You can see how it says negative 5, negative 4, negative 3. GM is very strange. I don't know why they do this, but actually negative 1 is that uh, th this is 5 seconds prior to impact. Sometimes the reason why this information has to be done by a certified person it's a little misleading sometimes because you look at this and go, well, at zero he was going nine, at three he was going 40. Uh, that's why some of the times this information records incorrectly, and you have to have a certified a person look at this data to, A, tell you if the download is correct, and, B, not just to kind of on face value accept this as fact. And I've had a lot of experiences where uh, the downloads, and I'll show you the next slide, is actually doing a tractor download, uh, where the downloads aren't accurate. Um, this is an EDR from a truck download, and we do a lot of these EDRs for truck downloads now. Uh, the truck downloads provide us a great deal of information if the tractor is available for download. Not every tractor is. Uh, the, the unit being being downloaded is on the right-hand side. That's their electronic da download unit. Uh, we interface with that, be able to get the information, and it gives us basically what's called hard brake application. So the, a vehicle is used on the deceleration of the car. So when it hits an object, there's a little unit in the car that triggers because it reaches a certain deceleration, and that also triggers the airbag and the seatbelts. Car uh, tractor trailers go by hard brake application. It's by the rotation of the tires. So this will this subject unit will give us two hard brake applications. It will give us the accident brake application and the nearest to date hard brake application of this tractor. It will give us the history of the tractor. Uh, it will give us quite a, a lot of valuable information in regards to the truck downloads. Uh, truck downloads are sensitive. Uh, you have to get to the truck uh, in its damaged state and hopefully before it's put back on the road if it's not a real fatal accident. Um, I call them short-lived uh, data. you got to get to them very quickly. Compare the airbag download, the diagram you just saw, and this is only three pages of the download of the tractor trailer. I just scanned in a couple. There is uh, usually about 17 to 20 pages of information in regards to the truck downloads. Now, going back to truck downloads, I told you there's hard brake application, including their speeds uh, of a hard brake application, their history of usage. It tells them basically how fast the history, uh, how fast this tractor trailer over its history has been run. Uh, it tells us engine settings. Uh, a lot of valuable information. I use this, uh, this was in Germany. And the reason why I use this one is I, I see this as a flatbed truck coming. I like the side view a little better. Um, the reason why I, I like presenting this type of, no, but like, no one was in these cars, so don't get worried about it. But um, the interesting part is when we have tractor-trailer collisions, you don't necessarily have to be the first car struck by a tractor trailer to be killed. 
Uh, in our area, on Route 78 and 80, when it gets lazy conditions, we have multi-vehicle pileups. And uh, in a lot of situations, it's not only the first car that gets killed, but, you know, we talk two or three cars after that that in these types of collisions people are killed. Uh, this is uh, breaking distance and skin marks for tractor trailers. And I wanted to just show you this for, uh, and I'll tell you, I'll explain as we go on. This is the breaking distance. If a tractor trailer was traveling on this roadway, and he was going 55 miles an hour, he would break to a stop. He would take 268 feet to break to a stop at 55 miles an hour. A good thumbnail when you're using distances is 300 feet to football field. So he's a little less than a football field, a breaking distance. Uh, you see those marks? Um, one of the questions, you know, I, I, when we're, if we were all sitting together, I'd ask you the following questions. Uh, unfortunately, we can't see everybody raise their hand, but the question is, do you think a tractor trailer brakes has a better braking efficiency, fully loaded or empty? Well, you know, probably half the class says one thing or the other. The, the answer would be it stops better fully loaded. People say, well, that's more weight. Well, that's true, but the braking systems are adjusted knowing that that's a condition. When it's empty, we have this type of braking uh, it's called a jump skid. And when a tractor breaks hard and the trailer is completely empty, uh, it starts to bounce on the roadway. And you can see the marks in between the skid marks. What that mark's indicating is the trailer is completely off the road. If not, uh, not the whole trailer, but some of the tires are off the road. When the tires are off the road, it's not having any efficient braking. So the answer to this would be that a uh, tractor trailer is fully loaded, has a break, better braking efficiency than one that would be empty. The uh, reason why, we'll, we'll keep going. The, the other thing is, at 55 miles an hour, we're going to do a quick calculation here because it's not on the slide. Well, when we talk about the ability of someone to stop a car, it basically goes into two areas. Well, one is the perception reaction time, and the other and the other section is braking. What a perception reaction time is is the time associated for the person to realize he's going to be in a collision. And during the daytime, in general, that takes about a second and a half. So in this case, in a second and a half, going at 55 miles an hour, this tractor trailer driver is going to need a distance to perceive and react of 121 uh, 121 feet. So add that to the 268. In this case, in this tractor trailer going at 55 miles an hour, he's going to need a distance of 388 feet to come to a controlled stop, perceive, react, and brake. We see these pileups for tractor trailers when they travel on the railway. Just think about your normal travel time uh, going down, uh, you know, my area like the Schuylkill Expressway. Tractor trailers do not follow you more than a football field away. So when an unexpected event happens in inclement weather, uh, we get these pileups because the tractor trailers don't have enough distance to be able to perceive, react, and stop before unexpected events occur. We got uh, pedestrian versus motorcycles. So we did tractor trailers. One thing I just want to leave you with the tractor trailer is the most accurate method to calculate speeds of tractor trailers are the downloads. Secondary would be in analyzing the scene information as far as the skid marks and the minimal speeds that the tractor trailer would give. Um, we'll do, uh, well, we have 15 minutes. We'll do pedestrian versus motorcycle cases. Uh, in some cases, we use the term vault. When you hear vault, what vault means is in pedestrian actions is uh, I use Granny the Beverly Hillbillies as an explanation. If, if you guys are old like me, uh, you remember Beverly Hillbillies when Granny used to ride on the top, top of a pickup truck. Well, if Jeff Rowe hit a tree, Granny on her little rocking chair on the top of the pickup truck flies off. Well, that distance that granny flies off is correlated to the speed in which the pickup truck hit the pole. That's kind of the idea of vault. So 
if we have a car that hits a pedestrian, we need to know, uh, ideally we need to know the height in which they were thrown, the angle in which they were thrown, and the distance in which they were thrown. Um, unfortunately, in pedestrian accidents, the height and the angle are difficult. There's formulas out there that give you general calculations and record just solely by the distance at which a pedestrian is thrown. Uh, the reason why I, I put this in is the point of impact. So if we have a person, we know where the point of impact is, and we know where their final rest is, we know that distance, that's the distance of the vault. But unfortunately, in most cases, the difficult part is being able to really determine where the pedestrian was hit on the roadway. So uh, in cases of pedestrian accidents, we, you know, you see I kind of impose this uh, jet on the right-hand side. Uh, what usually happens is the leading part of a truck, uh, leading part of a car, the front bumper, hits the pedestrian. They get projected backwards. They hit a windshield. Now, you have to be um, cautious of one thing. Sometimes police officers will go to a scene, they'll see a stopped car, and they'll see the pedestrian kind of laying at one point. And they'll assume from the point of impact of the final arrest was the vault. But in a lot of cases, you have to be aware that the pedestrian some kind, kind of gets stuck on the windshield like a bug. And when the car starts to break the final arrest, the pedestrian just kind of flops off. So you have to hire someone, you know, in those experience in pedestrian accident investigation, not to jump to quick conclusions. I kind of see that as a real serious problem with pedestrian accident investigations. Um, the individual, uh, the last question asked me, is there a thumbnail in which I can use, uh, you know, I'll meet with a client, uh, you know, and he's telling me the distance of the skid, is there a way for me to be able to tell the speed? This is the calculation. Velocity is actually, the V is actually the speed. So if you want to use this little skid mark, someone comes in, gives you a police report, says, hey, I was going down the roadway, I wasn't speeding, I was going 25 miles an hour, and this guy pulled out in front of me. And you see in the police report that it's a dry roadway, and you see that the skid distance that your client, or potential client left, say, was 300 feet. <laughs> Well, you're able to use this thumbnail calculation to be able to tell what the speed was dissipated by that skid mark that your client's talking about. Uh, I was telling you that, in general, we really don't know vaults and angles in which pedestrians are struck unless eyewitnesses can give us that. Uh, this is a very general vault pedestrian formula, another little thumbnail. If you know how far the pedestrian was thrown, you use this calculation, and it will give you the speed in which the impact generally, the speed in which the pedestrian was struck based on the vault of the pedestrian. This is that, and pedestrian cases aren't real accurate in, in high speeds for this one reason. Uh, a pedestrian vaults a distance of 50 feet basically equates to 33 miles an hour. 50 feet, okay, that's understandable. When we get to 55 feet, that same pedestrian would have to be vaulted 200 feet to be the equivalent to 55 miles an hour. Now, in, in cities, the uh, reason why we don't see this type of scenario is there's not an open space of 200 feet. They're usually going to hit another parked car, hit another car, and in general, when you look at crash tests, people just aren't like supermen. They just can't be thrown 200 feet in the air, very unlikely. Uh, it can happen, but very unlikely. So if you're looking at someone, you know, the speed limit's 55, they hit a pad, and you're looking for excessive speed based on a vault, you're probably not going to get there. But if you have speed limits, say, around 25, 30 miles an hour, you would be able to apply these types of formulas and uh get to where you need to go. Uh, basically, you need to know the length of the vault from the point of impact, uh, and it, it will give you the impact speed of the car when it strikes the pedestrian. I want to go back. The, the reason why this one I show you is kind of interesting, and people say, well, you can't know the height and you won't know the departure angle. Well, in this case, was a fatality, and the, and the person was walking down the shoulder of the roadway and struck from behind and killed by a drunk driver. 
Uh, know the point of impact because the uh, there was two eyewitnesses, and he also left his shoe on the roadway, which is, a, in general, a, a good determination of the point of impact. So uh, we know the point of impact. We know the distance of the vault. But this is kind of interesting because we know the height of the vault because the person was thrown from the point of impact and actually impacted at the top of the sign and came to a rest at the bottom. So not only will we be able to know the height of the vault, we're, not, we're able to know the angle of the vault, too. Uh, I've been doing this over 25 years now, and I present this one, and uh, this was probably one of the few ones we're able to get that accurate of a determination from. This is a pedestrian. You see the pedestrian walking uh, down the crosswalk. Here comes an accident, and he takes out the pedestrian. When I first saw this accident, I, I initially said, "Oh, that's pretty cool." <laughs> Known from the accident, and then I realized after presenting and looking at this tape over and over again that this is an animation. That it wasn't really the pedestrian. I like to show this because this is the type of capability animations now have, um, if you have the money, I mean, animations are expensive. They run, in general, they run probably about ten to $15,000. But uh, that's the type of uh, animation you can get as an exhibit to a jury. Um, we have one more video coming up. This is an interest. This happened, of course, all these wacky ones happened in India. Uh, you can see the person stopped at the median. He was crossing the roadway, and he's hit by a car that illegally passes vans that are stopped. The reason why I, I put this one up is a lot of times you get cases that just don't seem to make sense initially. So I would encourage your accident investigators to sometimes think outside the box because if you just kind of think in normal terms, a lot of times you really won't be able to figure out uh, pedestrian accidents. Um, we're going to keep moving on. We have five minutes here. I'm going to give you a quick motorcycle brake analysis. Uh, motorcycles as far as braking. Uh, in general, most motorcycles present it with a, uh, you know, an unexpected event, uh, usually only apply to rear brakes. Uh, that's not accepted practice, but that's kind of human nature. Uh, when someone just applies their rear brakes, they're only generating 35 to 40 percent braking capabilities. Uh, if they're able to successfully lock up their foot brake, their back brake, and their hand brake, they can generate up to 100 percent. But uh, when you lock up your front brake for some, you know, a, a, I say significant distance, you know, say 30, 40, the chances are your motorcycle is going to go down on the ground. You're going to lose control. So that's why, in general. Most motorcycle operators only use the rear brakes. Oh, let me do this one again. This is a good explanation of a vault from a motorcycle. You can see the car turning. You can see the motorcycle operator being vaulted off the motorcycle. Uh, if we know, just like the pedestrian, if we know the point of impact, which we do in this case, we know the distance in which the, the operator was thrown, we can apply vault calculations. And, and that will tell us the speed at which the motorcycle hit that car to be able to produce that person vaulting off the motorcycle. Uh, in general, vault speeds for motorcycles produce lower speeds, and the reason I wanted to show you one more time is uh, when the person is, hopefully it doesn't freeze, when the person's vaulted off the motorcycle, look at what he does. He doesn't fly off like Superman. Uh, see how he kind of does with 360 barrel rolls? The reason why that is in motorcycles, when they're vaulted off the seat, their knees usually come in contact with the handlebars, tend to spend, send someone into a spin like that. Uh, spinning like that takes more energy than just completely flying off. And so if the distance is smaller, lower speed, distance greater, higher speed. This is a, a strange, uh, as well enough. 
this is a strange motorcycle accident in China. And the reason why I want to show you is sometimes there's not much you really can do. Someone runs a red light. Motorcycle impacts a car. He basically flies directly up in the air and comes straight down on the roadway. Now, what we just talked about, the car hit in a barrier. We should be able to calculate his speed for if we did the crush analysis on the car. And he's okay. His arm's moving. But as far as, like, a vault calculation, he didn't have a vault. He basically kind of just popped right up in the air and right straight down. So there are some scenarios which you'll get where an accident expert may actually call you and go, I really can't help you that much. There's not enough here. Or the accident scenario doesn't support any kind of way of calculating a speed. Well, it looks like we're right on time here. We have uh, maybe five minutes to uh, answer some uh, Q&A questions, uh, if you have some. Uh, if you... Okay, uh, Frank, thank you so much. Uh, we do have some questions and answers, and actually um, my computer um, is experiencing technical difficulties. So if you could read the questions that have come into the Q&A, uh, since the last break, I believe Steve had one, um, and there's another one out there. He submitted a question uh, via the chat. Can you uh, resubmit it to the uh, to the Q and A section so that um, our presenter Frank can see them? So Frank, if there are any questions in the Q and A, I believe there's one from Stephen. Uh, can you read it and just answer it? Yeah, it says a jump skid in a semi case is similar to a speed wobble that occurs on bicycles and sometimes motorcycles, I assume. Uh, no. Uh, a jump skid is when the tire for a period of time actually becomes airborne. A speed wobble, which we see in motorcycle cases, are um, speed wobbles are when you see how a skid mark is kind of the same uh, define width and length. As you look at a speed wobble, you'll start to see the skid mark kind of take different appearances. It will get thin, it will get wider. It means that the tire is actually skidding, but, you know, wobbling. It's coming on its side and maybe on an angle. But uh, I don't see a motorcycle tire actually getting airborne, so that would not be the same as a jump skid. And it, it, that occurs on bicycles. Uh, I don't know. There would be different situations. Uh, uh, one person said, how reliable are pictures in crush analysis and how to ensure the pictures are valid for the analysis? Uh, it depends what kind of angle the crush analysis. There can be photos taken crush-wise that will give you, if you looked at the manufacturer's specification and you have the right type of photograph, it can give you a depth appearance. Uh, so it depends on the pictures that you have. Um, it would have to be pretty good pictures. And it says, uh, how do you ensure the pictures are valid for the analysis? Uh, how would you ensure the pictures are valid? Well, I guess my answer to that would, the only way to validate whether a picture is representative of the crush is, unfortunately, to see a car. <laughs> That's the only way I know how to answer that picture. I mean, you'll have a picture... You'll have crush damage of the car. If you want someone to be able to say that that picture represents the damage to the car, then someone would have to testify that he actually saw the damage of the car and it looks like the photograph. Okay, great. There is a question out there uh, that was submitted to me uh, over the chat, and I can't actually see the chat because, I'm, as I said, I'm having technical difficulties, but I believe Lawrence uh, Hoodick uh, did submit that question. So if you could submit that to Frank, uh, over the chat or the Q&A, uh, we could get that answered for you as quickly as possible. Yeah, there's um, one other, Okay. Um, there's okay. one question Thank came you. in. Should I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Frank. Uh, it says, that, do all tractor trailers have red boxes that you showed in the photograph? Basically, the question is, do all box, are all tractors able to be downloaded? And the answer would be no. It really depends on the engine module. And it depends on the year, make, and model of the tractor. The newer the tractor, newer when I say like 2011, usually from 2005 on up, it depends on the engine, whether it's a Cummins engine. Uh, most Freightliners are able to be downloaded. But it would have to be, uh, be able to be downloaded. So we can tell you that before, uh, yeah, 
it's very easy. It's just a drop-down box. It'll be able to tell you by the VIN number whether that tractor trailer would be able to be downloaded. Uh, Oh, okay. A loaded question. In experience, do you find the experts hired by the state in fatalities as thorough as you are? If not, what do they seem to miss? Um, I think I think education has raised the level in which people investigate accidents. In most count counties in Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, they have uh, they tip. People from different departments put together and they call them, you know, fatal accident units. So they all go out and kind of go out. They're pretty capable. I mean, they'll use a total station to document the scene. Uh, they'll do downloads. Uh, the people I uh, kind of bumped into, uh, I find, uh, you know, pretty good at what they do. Uh, what they lack, um, Probably the answer to that is not every person who's uh, in charge or in a fatal accident unit has actually been to court to testify, which surprises me. I mean, when you speak to an individual, and I, I pretty easy to get along with and have good rapport with the police, I'm kind of surprised when you talk to some of the guys in these fatal accident units that they've been doing it, you know, accident investigation for you know, 15 years, and you say, well, how many times have you been to court? And they say, I, I haven't been to court. I haven't had the opportunity to be to court yet. So I guess that's probably what they're lacking is sometimes they, they're very knowledgeable, and they know what they're doing, but they just don't really have the court uh, expertise. Okay, great. Um, do you see any more questions in the queue, Frank? Yeah, there's one other question. It says, how do you account for the difference in the length of skid marks between the right and left? Uh, yeah, very, very, uh, you'd be hard-pressed to have a car lock up its skid marks and have the length, the, the left skid mark be the same as the right. The, reason, it's, the answer to that in accidents is usually some weight shift. And weight shift is usually the individual, uh, you know, uh, tried to steer right, just prior to the action, maybe had the tires pinched a little bit to the right. There's a little bit of weight shift, and the weight shift's going to kind of contribute to why the left tire was. Sometimes you even see cases where the right tire doesn't track at all. You know the brakes are working, but you just don't see a skid mark, and that usually has to do with weight shift. Uh, in some cases where you have left side skid marks and no right side skid marks. You definitely want that vehicle inspected to make sure there's no mechanical issues with the car. Okay, great. Um, there being no other questions in the queue that I can tell, and again, I'm having technical difficulties, so I can't really see my screen. Um, I, I want to thank. I want to wrap things up here. Um, first, I'd like to thank Frank uh, for taking the time out of his schedule to put together a very thorough presentation. Um, I, I do believe that um, there was some great information in there, and uh, we will be sending out a copy of that PowerPoint presentation tomorrow morning with a link to the archive recording as well. Uh, that will be all uh, bundled in an email that will go out uh, hopefully before 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, we do ask that you take time to fill up the survey that will appear on your screen after I uh, end the program. And um, if you have a case that you would like to talk to Frank about, uh, you can contact us here at CAFA. Our telephone number is 1-800-523-2319, and my email address is in all of the communications that you have received from us and that you will be receiving um, in the future. Um, we hope to see you at future CAFA events. Uh, we will be holding another webinar on, uh, on February 2nd, or sorry, on March 2nd, and then we have uh, two additional webinars, one in the middle of March and one at the end of March. So please look. Uh, in your inbox for those invitations. Thank you again for your time, Frank. Thank you for your uh, presentation, and uh, we, we look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Thanks for uh, everybody attending. Have a good day.